Thank you. And let's discover some more reality with our next speaker, Martina Terbanz. She's researcher at the Social Protect Protection Institute of Republic of Slovenia. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I, I think I'm in, I'm in a very difficult situation now, uh, not because of, <laughs> uh, because of PowerPoint, but because of the start of this um, um, discussion, uh, which was so great and so complex that um, I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to fit in. So, um, well, at least it came at the end with the discussion in a bit more policy or practical. Um, okay, uh, practical um, issues. Um, maybe just um, um, at the beginning, so that you can understand um, the way how I'm uh, talking about the things. Um, I come from the. Yes. This is also hard for me to, <laughs> to stand like this and, and, and um, lecture. Um, I come from the uh, Social Protection Institute, which is a, a small policy institute. So um, it's more about, um, um, we deal more um, with the policy issues. We work a lot for the Ministry of Labor, Family, Social Affairs and Equal Opportunities. Um, doing uh, monitoring tasks about different policies, some evaluation, um, different background papers, and so on. So it's more uh, practical, the things that I'm uh, going to talk about. Um, for example, we did last year um, um, a study, uh, social situation in Slovenia, a rather complex study on this, um, which is the beginning of, um, it will become annual now, um, and we will have different focus um, every year. Um, it's quite hard now to begin, really, because um, already much was said at the beginning with the introduction of um, Mrs. Um, Felicita Medved. Um, I, I wanted at the beginning of the presentation to um, say something a little bit more general about the connection between employment and social protection system. Now, as some things were already said, I will shorten this, this, um, this part. Um, I think the key problem in Europe today is um, deriving from the way how the, the social state or the welfare state developed in close connection between the employment system and the social system. We know, we know that um, the, the social protection system developed out of different um, protection insurances. So this, the, the, the first or the main part of the social system is based on social insurance still, and this is one of the, of the problems. Um, and then there's also the part um, which is a kind of safety net for those that are not insured for different risks, mainly risks uh, deriving from different situations, life situations and labor market situations. Um, so because of the development that um, um, of, of um, development in the sphere of work, of jobs, of labor markets um, that we listened um, before, um, this connection or interconnection between social protection and um, employment is, um, is very much questioned today. Um, still the silent or the underlying um, um, assumption of practically all systems, current systems um, in, in Europe is that most people will, most of their lives, working lives, work. Um, when, when they will not work for different reasons, they will use the insurance that they paid through the employers and so on. Um, 
in the time when they were working. Um, the problem is that, because of different reasons, more and more people are not insured um, the way as permanently employed people used to be insured. So um, the problem is that more and more people come directly to this safety net of um, social support, which is really low or relatively low. Um, and this, this connection is becoming more and more problematic, but um, practically um, all countries still stick with this. Uh, all governments um, at the national level and also at the level of European Commission, the, there's practically no move from this um, interaction. They are the, the solutions that are um, being um, looked for are mainly in the same, in the same, go mainly in the same direction. There, there is no, no step out of this um, framework or frame. The problem is, as I said, that um, more and more people um, are left out of this system for different reasons. One of the reasons is also that um, um, some segments of jobs are disappearing. And there's still many people who are qualified for these segments of um, jobs and will never really be able to reskill or go to education and change completely because, it, because they are not so young anymore, because they worked in, I don't know, some labor-intensive industries for 20 years or something. So actually this structural unemployment, the share of people who will probably not be employed, or at least not employed in a stable sense, um, is increasing. Um, um, on the other side, there are more and more of these, let's say, flexible types of employment. I mean, the, not that they are emerging because they are here for quite some time already, but the, the shares are increasing. And um, just for... Just for um, an illustration, this is the, um, the trend, how the numbers of employed in EU, um, the numbers are not important, just if you look at the red line, how the numbers of employed people in the EU um, are going. So there was, um, just before the, the recent crisis, the, the last crisis, there was a peak, and then it went down a little bit up, but here we are. I don't think we will ever reach the peak from before the crisis again. Um, but if we look at the other, the other chart, how the numbers of employed in flexible jobs are moving, we see that there is, um, there is an increase. There is an increase in part-time, especially, in the number of people part employed part-time. There is also, if you look at the black line at the, at the bottom, there's also an, an slight increase in the number of people working two jobs because they cannot survive of one job only, mostly it's two part-time jobs, and um, um, slight increase in the number of people working fixed term. And we are talking about EU 27. I will show the, the, the charts for Slovenia uh, later on. It's much more, it's even much more um, um, stressed, the, the trends. Um, so the, the problem is um, that most of these people who work in these flexible um, jobs are not insured for the, same, for the same, let's say, level of social rights um, that then people who work in classical um, jobs. And consequently, of course, they, they are more at risk um, of poverty in general because their levels of income are not so high and also um, they're more at risk of um, staying out of this system. Um, the, the two recent studies, one was done by the European Commission, uh, it's titled Employment and Social Development in Europe 2015. I'm not even sure if it's published. Um, yet. The other is the study of Eurofound, the European Foundation for the Improvement of Working and Living Conditions, uh, on drivers of recent job polarization. They both 
point at the fact that the job polarization is increasing. The job polarization between low paid jobs and high paid jobs. Um, even before the crisis, there was um, the, the development showed that the, um, the, the, there was a, a growth in the segments of low paid jobs and in the segments of, um, of uh, well paid jobs, while the middle paid jobs were somehow steady, let's say. Um, the crisis um, even more stressed this trend, and the, the middle wage jobs are um, experiencing the negative growth. And the expectations for the future go in line with this. Um, the, 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 um, the jobs that will slowly start to, let's say, disappear are mainly these um, middle wage jobs. So basically, we can expect if there are no major changes that it will be possible to get this more low paid, let's say, type of jobs. And also on the other side, there is, a, as we were listening, there is a development in the, in the well-paid jobs um, segments, which are more demanding um, educationally, technical, technologically, and so on. Um, but um, the, this, um, as I said before, structurally unemployed people who were um, educated and taught for this and skilled for these middle-paid jobs will really have um, major problems in finding um, their way in the system. Um, well, as I mentioned before, policy responses to these developments at the, um, uh, um, at the labor market um, at the EU level and at the level of the national states are really mostly profiled in the policy responses that were already existing before, like um, in social transfers, more targeting, less universal transfers, more targeted towards the people that really are without the incomes, that really need to survive, that need the transfers to survive. Um, and this is true also for um, um, countries of so-called Scandinavian welfare model that used to have um, more of these universal transfers are now somehow going a step um, in another direction. More conditionality in um, giving people the, the social rights that are not um, um, insurance connected. Um, and then policies like or, or um, actions, measures like social and employment activation, um, skilling people, reskilling people, b um, building capacities and so on. All the policies that go in the direction that we need to help people to reintegrate to the labor market. So um, basically, we only have policy solutions and actions at the moment that go at the EU um, level and at the level of European national states that go into the same direction as in the past, although it's becoming clear that this kind of um, connection between employment and social system, social protection system, will probably not survive in the future because it's based in the, in the old industrial um, um, way of, um, um, let's say, um, of the systems, yeah. Um, the solutions that are um, in principle on the table or are being discussed in a more academic environment like um, redistribution of income, uh, redistribution of work uh, by recognition, as it was mentioned uh, in the introduction, are at the policy level not really seriously discussed. I can say this because I also um, sometimes represent Slovenia at the Social Protection Committee at the, at the EU level um, and in the Indicators um, Committee, which is a subgroup of this Social Protection Committee. And um, um, although there are different discussions, this kind of um, potential solutions or directions 
which are more innovative and would really, in a way, change the system are not really um, discussed seriously. Um, now I go to Slovenia in this context. Um, Well, yeah, wow. <laughs> I wanted to come to this at the end when I talk about Slovenia and, 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 and question myself. I wanted to question myself at the end whether it's possible to, to do anything at the national level because, because of all the interactions between the countries and because of, you know, labor markets and economies that interact so much. It's really a question if it's possible to change anything on the level of one country. Well, personally, personally and professionally, my, my favorite, how to say, direction of change would be into the direction of, um, of acknowledging different forms of work um, and, and this redistribution of work via um, shortening the, the working time. And I'm not talking about the radical steps, but because this would still be in line with this um, with some sort of connection between social and, and employment system. It would not change this radically, so it would probably be much easier to, to make changes in this, in this direction. I think at the end, it is a redistribution of income in any, in any sense. It's just the way how you do it, how you also involve people, because um, um, integrate people in this. Because I think one of the main problems I, I I work a lot on the issues of poverty um, and social inequalities and so on. And I think one of the main issues now is not so much the poverty itself, the, the financial poverty, because all, all, all countries in Europe have some protection systems that at least prevent this absolute poverty, survival. Um, I mean, at least guarantee the survival of people. The problem is social exclusion, really. The problem is, I mean, the problem, of course the poverty is a problem, don't get me wrong, but the, the main issue, I think, now is becoming the social exclusion, because we have all this, we have this strong polarization. We have um, increasing number of people that are excluded from the employment and from work, from, from labor, let's say, and will probably never come in again and there are different consequences of this, not just in terms of how much you have, the, the, the money you have, the, the, uh, the disposable income you have. So I, I think we should, and also um, at the EU level and at the Slovenian level, we all experience this, um, um, not just the increase in inequalities, but also the, the, the rupture of social fabric, how to say. The, 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 the differences um, between regions, the distrust of people um, the, in, in institutions, in everything, this is the consequence of the fact that people, some people feel excluded, and more and more people feel excluded. So it's not only in the financial, let's say, measures, it's, it's how to reorganize the system in the way that it integrates as many people as possible. Um, like we, like in the in the in the industrial society, um, um, it was uh, the expectation of let's say full employment. I remember when I when I was still doing my studies, there was the, the we there was this um, question of how much unemployment can one economy or one system um, sustain. Well. We were, at that time, we were talking about maybe 3, 4 percent, 5 percent. What is the, the, the limit of uh, unemployment that the, 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 the system can, uh, the, the, the society can sustain? As we can see now, it's much higher and there's no limit, actually. <laughs> um, okay, go back to, I go to Slovenia now. Um, um, Before the crisis, um, we had a, a period from, let's say, 2000 on, a period of economic growth, of employment growth, um, and the feeling was 
mm, that this growth will go on. I remember we, we had election just before the crisis, I think probably in 2008, we had the, the, um, the general election. Um, and listening to the politicians that discuss different issues, no one of them really took the, the, the threat of crisis, economic crisis seriously. They were all discussing that this will not be a problem for Slovenia. We are doing so well, there is no reason at all that the, the crisis will hit us. I mean, of course, the, the first reason is that Slovenia is so small and so connected to other European countries that there, if there's a crisis in Germany, then we are gone because there are so many companies working for German companies and so many, so it's, but it, they were really convincing each other and the public, and I even think that they really believed it, that in Slovenia, we are doing so well that there will, no, will be no problem with the, with the crisis. Um, but the, the, the reason why um, the crisis, the economic crisis hit Slovenia so strongly, I think is mostly in, uh, in the structure of economy that we had before the crisis. In the fact that this deindustrialization process was never really um, carried, carried out um, to the extent that it should be, because, because there were still so many labor-intensive companies, um, enterpri big enterprises, employing so many people that, you know, everyone was afraid of what would happen if, if some of these uh, companies would go to bankruptcy. 5,000 employees is a huge number in Slovenia, especially out of Ljubljana in some, in some other regions, when these, are, these were the main employers. Um, and with the crisis, especially because it, it, it's, it lasted for so long, um, it, it was not possible because of the budgetary problems and so on for the pol pol politicians to support this type of companies or enterprises anymore, so the bankruptcies actually happened, um, which would probably happen anyway. It was just prolonged, and it all happened during the crisis. And the unemployment, of course, went up really, really considerably. Um, at the beginning of independence in 1993, um, we had uh, unemployment of 9.4% 9 9 labor force survey unemployment. And this was the, the highest um, and since then, it went down. In 2008, it was um, in 2008, it was 4.4%. Uh, so this was somehow the expectation that this is how it should be. In 2013, it went again up to 10.4, which is the highest unemployment ever. I'm talking about the labor force survey um, uh, numbers, the highest unemployment ever. Um, and the unemployment of young people also increased really a lot, which is logical because the employment was practically closed. It was, since 2008, practically impossible for a young graduate or any other young person to, to find employment um, because of the way how the, the, the enterprises were reacting, um, not renewing the fixed-term contracts um, and so on. So it's, um, so it was, um, before the crisis in 2008, it was 7.9%. The youth unemployment um, in 2013, it was 22.1%. So it really increased um, a lot. Um, the main problem of Slovene unemployment is its structural nature, because um, many people who are uh, really many people who um, used to work in this labor intensive, not to repeat myself, so you, you get the picture. Um, it's a problem all over Europe. It's um, even more stressed in, in Slovenia. Um, the long-term nature of unemployment, most of these people or a large part of these people have no chances of getting the job again. And what we found out in the um, uh, social situation uh, study last year, um, about half of these unemployed people uh, do not have any transfer, income transfer from the state. Only around, um, if we look at all registered unemployed people, 
only um, around 20% uh, have uh, unemployment benefit, the insurance-based unemployment benefit, which means that they've been employed before. Um, and only about 30% have um, um, financial social assistance, which means that about 45 to 50% of unemployed, registered unemployed people do not have any income, at least not income that we could register, at least not any formal income, which means that they are, um, they are supported by partners, parents, grandparents, or they work um, on the black market. Uh, but we are talking about around 50,000 people, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge number. Um, and, and during the crisis, these flexible types of employment um, increased a lot. The segmentation, um, the segmentation labor market was always a strong um, uh, characteristic of Slovenian labor market, but it used to be the segmentation before the permanent, full-time, open-ended um, uh, jobs which prevailed and the, part, um, the, the fixed term jobs which were mainly taken by or given to young people. In the past, it used to be a kind of entrance to the labor market and to the job, to the employment system. First, you had a fixed term job, maybe the second time also a fixed term job, then there was some kind of transition into an into a, a, a open-ended contract. Now it's, um, now it's more the, the segmentation between um, uh, full-time, um, permanent jobs, open-ended jobs, and all other forms of more flexible, flexible, formal types of work, like self-employment, uh, part-time, uh, fixed-term, um, um, student jobs, and other forms of, of jobs. And this polarization is, is becoming really strong because the, in Slovenia, the social rights that are um, linked to these um, um, open-ended uh, contracts, full-time open-ended contracts, are as a legacy of the past, and relatively strong unions in these negotiations are still um, um, relatively good. Um, especially if you compare them with the, with the possibilities and rights of these more flexible um, uh, jobs. I will just show, because I think I... I, mm, I will just show... Um, uh, this is the chart showing um, the, the, the trends in uh, different types of flexible employment. Oh, sorry, I, um, it's in Slovene. Um, the, the yellow is self-employed, which is, as you can see, increasing. Um, the green is uh, fixed term, the red is part-time, and the blue is um, other forms of work. Uh, but basically, all these flexible types of employment are, in are increasing um, since the, the end of 90s. Um, okay, this is, um, this is something I wanted to show um, for the end. Um, the connection between different types of flexible, um, more flexible jobs and, um, um, and the poverty rates, at risk of poverty rates. If you look at self-employed, which is the, the, um, um, the line, the, red, the dark red line, you can see that um, not only that there is a connection, but it's becoming even stronger. It's becoming more emphasized. Um, in 2013, the self-employed people had um, um, a, a risk of poverty rate at nearly 28%. Um, compared to uh, the, the, um, the black line, open-ended contract, this is the, the permanent type of contract, which is um, um, at risk of poverty rate um, around 4%. So it's really quite a difference because of the way um, of course, because of um, the incomes and, and the, the distribution of incomes and also because of the way how um, the social protection and the, the social system is um, related to the, to the employment system. I'll stop with this because I'm too late probably. <laughs>